So I'm Phil Astley and I'm the City Archivist for Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire Archives. And I got into archive work um, initially by doing voluntary work at what was then the Scottish Record Office in Edinburgh. And after that I worked at the Orkney Library and Archive for about 10 years and then jumped across the Pentland Firth to the North Highland Archive in Wick and then um, moved down to Aberdeen in 2004, um, initially to work at the university, but then um, I moved to my current job um, in 2008 and have been there ever since. I'm Wilma Baumeister. I'm a freelance consultant in collection care. I work with uh, museums and galleries and historic houses and sometimes private owners uh, helping them to look after their collections and I'm doing that through advice on the care for their objects and how to prevent damage. And in the context for this talk, um, I'd like to look at the long-term preservation of the material that you deal with in your archive context. Um, of course, a lot of the material that comes to archives might come there because there's a legal obligation for the material to be held, or they might be family or company archives. Uh, different kind of materials might be found in those archives. We tend to think of them as paper, but of course we now have, uh, we've had tape, cassettes, we've had the digital formats of CD and DVD and other types. Um, but material might also come in um, in its traditional paper format and I suppose people bring in bundles and those bundles might have paper clips, they might have staples, they might have rubber bands around rolled up documents. So we're finding all kinds of alien materials mm -hmm. attached to those paper documents that may be were better if they were not there because they might be damaging to them. We're looking at long-term storage and of course that means items spend most of their time in storage but they will be brought out from time to time for your researchers. You have search rooms where researchers can come and study the material. Material might go on loan to a temporary exhibition somewhere and then we also get to deal with issues such as handling uh, and moving items and how can we best do that safely. So um, I see you've brought some items with you today and they've come on a trolley. Yeah, they have indeed the good old archive trolley, which um, is one of the um, easiest way to transport um, items around um, the archive. And it also means that you only have to take it from the shelf put it on the trolley and wheel it through. And there's also kind of health and safety um, aspects to that as well. Mm -hmm. So is that to do with your lifting items off shelves or? That's right. I mean, some of the items, some of the boxes that we have can be quite heavy. So um, obviously um, using a, a trolley decreases the amount of time that you need to um, take carrying items from A to B through the repository and they can also be quite awkward shapes as well you said in your introduction Wilma that archives um, more or less come in all shapes and sizes and from different places as well so um, at Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire Archives we have um, items from the two local authorities but also from businesses and private individuals so it's a whole range of items. It's quite mind-boggling, actually, the, the range of items that we have from volumes and sh single sheets of paper through to photographs, um, magnetic tapes, I think you mentioned maps, plans. Um, the, you know, the range of things is quite, um, quite endless, almost. Yeah. yeah. So can we talk through some of the things that you've brought with you today? Of course, where, where should we start? Should we start with the school logbook? Well, we might as well, since we have this so neatly lying in front of us. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a 19th century um, school logbook. Um, it has been rebound um, and 
we tend to, um, in the archive, we consult volumes um, by uh, putting them on uh, book rests such as this when, um, when people are um, looking at them. Um, it helps support the spine of the, the volume. Um, and it also helps the, the person who's reading it by elevating it a little bit off the table. And um, you can angle them so that they're facing the, um, the reader uh, and it just makes it a little bit more, more comfortable. Um, it's um, obviously paper. Um, the paper is yellowing slightly. Um, you can see around the edges. Um, it's probably not um, the best kind of quality paper. They were mass produced, these, these log books. Um, but with, with careful handling, you know, they will last an awful long time. So I guess books like this were not really made to last as long as we make them last in the archives. Or they, or they might have chosen a different type of paper because of course originally paper was made with rags, mm -hmm. uh, cotton or linen rags, and that gave a very nice fiber that be produced a beautiful high quality type mm -hmm. of paper. And then we get into the 19th century and into industrialization mm -hmm. and we discover that we can make paper from trees, which is a lot cheaper. <laughs> and a lot quicker, but it has kind of pollutants locked into the paper. Mm -hmm. And of course, those pollutants, if you like, the acidity develops over time. And that's what you mentioned, where the mm -hmm. paper has started to yellow. That's right. And, um, you know, these, it's interesting what you say about the items being created for different purposes. You know, they, the, the teacher, when they were, they were writing this log, but probably never thought that it was going to be kept for um, well, this particular item is 150 or so years old um, and it was kept for completely different purposes than, um, you know, the researcher today is looking at it for. So, um, so yeah, those different aspects of the creation of the, the paper and the longevity um, are really interesting. Mm -hmm. And when people come to consult books like this, are there particular things you ask them to do before they can have access to this book? Are there specific conditions they must meet? Well, we have in the two search rooms, um, search room guidelines, which we ask people to read on arrival. And it's um, basic common sense, really. So um, we ask them to um, put their bags in a certain place in the search room um, so that people aren't tripping over them um, and they also reduces the scope for um, uh, people um, stealing things for example. Um, we ask people not to eat and drink um, around the items because obviously um, you know uh, food or liquids can do immediate damage to uh, items. Um, we insist on people using the uh, good old-fashioned uh, HP pencil um, for taking notes. Um, if they're, I mean, these day and age, this day and age, there's an awful lot of laptops being used in, in the search room. But if people are taking uh, physical notes, um, the, the insistence is on um, pencils. Mm -hmm rather than pens, which obviously, or biros, which can mark documents, um, at least with a pencil, if you inadvertently brush against um, a document such as the, uh, the logbook here, um, you know, the, the pencil mark could be removed. Yeah. I see you've got some other things in your books there too, including mm -hmm. a pair of blue um, latex gloves. Is that something you would ask visitors to wear? Well, normally we don't um, if they're simply consulting um, a volume or paper such as this. Um, we tend to find that um, the use of gloves by researchers, um, the manual dexterity um, is reduced when they're wearing gloves. So when they turn the page, um, it's quite often the case that with gloves on, um, they're, it's more awkward for them to do it. Um, we do, however, um, ask people to wear nitrile gloves such as these ones when um, looking at photographs. It, 
if the photographs aren't enclosed um, in Melanex. That brings us neatly onto the contents of one of these boxes. Indeed. So we're talking yeah. about storage materials and how to protect items while they're being handled. And can we have a look at the photographs collection yes, that you've brought? Indeed. Uh, I think it's the box just on the uh, underneath here. So if I move this over here. And um, I mean, the first thing to notice really is that the, uh, the photographs um, are within a box. Now, um, it's a very basic kind of um, step to take, but by boxing things, you are protecting them from um, water ingress is the main thing. So if there was a burst pipe in the, um, in the strong room, for example, um, the, the box itself would provide protection. But um, we were speaking a minute ago um, about handling photographs and how uh, normally if a photograph were not enclosed um, like this one, um, we would insist on wearing nitrile gloves. But um, by far a better way to store and look at photographs is when they're enclosed in this kind of Melanex um, material. Um, this particular box is from the Aberdeen Harbour Board collection, which is a big collection of business records relating to the Harbour Board, and that has uh, a huge collection of photographs within it, of which th this is just a small um, sample. But as you can see, um, the photographs themselves are in these um, Melanex enclosures, um, which enables the photographs to be handled. They're quite robust. In this, it also means that you can very easily see the, um, the writing that's on, sometimes on the front, sometimes on the reverse of these photographs. And it just makes the whole, um, whole collection a lot more durable. And this material is a polyester material, as opposed to the kind of poly pockets that we all buy at the stationers. That's right, that's right. You can, you can just the, the feel of these, um, is quite different from the poly pocket material. Now, um, we do quite often find that um, photographs do come to us in poly pocket enclosures. Um, I think people with the best of intentions put them in these poly pockets. But um, as you say, the material is such that it quite often adheres to the mm -hmm. surface of the photograph yeah. and um, can do them uh, permanent damage because of that. Whereas this material, um, is quite inert and um, it doesn't adhere to the surface of the photographs and as we've just been saying it makes it a lot more durable to to handle them it's a great method of uh, making photos accessible and handleable that's right mm -hmm. so um the box itself looks like it is just an ordinary brown cardboard box, but it isn't, is it? Is this an acid-free box? It is an acid-free box. Um, so that's important because any kind of moisture uh, in the air, if it were to combine with um, a potentially acidic substance, would create a, a dilute acid substance, which would have a detrimental effect on the, the contents of the box. But these... These boxes are indeed um, acid free and they're commercially um, freely available. Um, and we use these an awful lot. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So this is the kind of material that we tend to refer to as archival quality storage mm -hmm. materials. That's right. And you can see things like um, these uh, envelopes that we, we have here are made from similarly um, acid-free um, paper and these come in all sorts of shapes and sizes um, because of the fact that archives themselves are um, they range widely in shapes and size so um, these um, these items are all acid-free and um, are suitable for storing paper um, and photographs indeed as well and in terms of storing the boxes, 
How does an archive go about that? Do you have them just sitting on tables or are they on shelves or? They're on um, shelves. Um, so it's um, mobile racking, so high density storage. Um, and for the square footage of the storage areas that we have, mobile shelving increases the storage area that you can uh, utilise within, within that given space. Um, but it's, um, it's probably about two and a half kilometres worth of records that we have. If you were to lay all the boxes and plans and so on kind of end to end, um, it's a huge, huge collection. Um, but boxes are the, by far and away the, the most efficient means of storing them and the, the shelves themselves can move up and down and um, we do periodically have to re, um, rejig things within storage areas so uh, that's always quite entertaining it's like the um, you know a big game of Tetris trying to uh, fit things in sometimes but um, uh, the protection that's provided by these sorts of enclosures are, um, you know, by far and away the, the best that we can, we can uh, achieve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, having first of all the sleeve and then around that the box and then around that the closed bay of your roller racking, mm -hmm. we keep adding kind of protective envelopes and that helps mm -hmm. the environment for the photos to be as stable as possible as well. That's right. Yeah, I mean, the, the rooms, uh, ideally, the, the environment within them is monitored. Um, we don't actually have any environmental control, such as dehumidifiers or air conditioning. Um, although we do find that the buildings that we have and the storage areas that we have are naturally fairly good mm -hmm. at maintaining um, a fairly decent environment within the parameters of 13 to 20 degrees C. Um, for paper, you want to aim to be roughly at the, the lower end of that, uh -huh. that scale. Um, we have in the past, in some of the rooms, put blinds on the windows to reduce the amount of thermal gain and temperature uh, fluctuations within the room. Um, humidity wise, you want to aim at between around about 35% and 60% humidity for, for paper. I mean, ideally, photographs um, need to be kept at a good bit cooler mm -hmm. than um, paper. But um, some archives you will um, find do have dedicated photograph storage areas. And similarly, things like glass negatives would be stored at a much, much lower temperature than um, paper. Mm -hmm. But you're quite right, the, these layers of environmental and physical control all help to build up a, a kind of holistic um, environment that is best for storing um, paper yeah. um, and photographs within. So we've talked a bit about the materials that you use to store the items so that whenever something comes into contact with a storage material you make sure that that is a high quality and inert mm -hmm. material. Now, with the book, we talked about how the book itself can actually be made of a material that's not necessarily mm. um, made to last very long or not of great quality material. And in archives, we can find examples of those, for instance, in newspaper. Mm. Newspaper must be about the poorest quality paper you can get. It's made for one day. Mm -hmm. Yesterday's news is no longer interesting today. And of course, a similar issue uh, we now know about happens with the, the early types of film. And film, of course, like books and documents, is also a carrier of information that gets kept in repositories. And we now know that the early carrier of the film can be so unstable that in its degradation, it gives off products that become explosive. Mm -hmm. um, so it just shows that it's not only about the materials that we add in order to store, it's also the things themselves that can create the problems. And particularly in film archives, that is a real issue, mm -hmm. but perhaps not so much in your 
particular situation? No, we we don't actually have um, film. We if if film does come to us, we send it down to the um, Scottish Screen Archive at the National Library mm -hmm. of Scotland, which is Scotland's dedicated um, film uh, archive, um, and they have the technical uh, capability and uh, technology um, in order to best store um, and indeed make these items available. Mm -hmm. um, their website is quite amazing uh, if you've ever seen it, it's, uh, that's worth a, a look. Um, but uh, no, we, we give any film that comes to us to them in order to, for them to digitise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so they'll take it off the medium that it comes in. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they get rid of the potential explosions. Mm -hmm. um, what about outsized objects, things that don't fit neatly into a, a box? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of plans, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of documents that might have had seals attached mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. um, well, they quite often have to have special enclosures uh, made for them. Now I've got an example uh, here, which um, is quite a, it's quite a unique um, item. Um, it's over 700 uh, years old, this, this charter. Um, but as you can see, it's, um, it's got its own um, special enclosure here, it was previously kept in um, kind of a perspex enclosure, mm -hmm. if you like, but um, which had a, a bottom to it and a top, and, a top, and the, the two parts of it were kind of screwed together. But the charter itself is made from parchment, which is um, sheep skin. And you can, it's got this kind of yellowish colour, it's quite characteristic of parchment. Um, so it's, a, it's an organic material and the perspex enclosure w in which it was previously housed, um, it wasn't really allowing it to expand and contract and um, there were certain features of the document that were obscured. Um, for example, in the previous enclosure, this lovely uh, tag for the seal was folded up so when we had this conserved um, about a year ago, the conservator um, took it out of the perspex enclosure and uh, relaxed the document in a humidity chamber. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the parchment was allowed to kind of absorb a little bit of uh, moisture and that helped it kind of relax. So um, that took some of the creases out, although um, the creases themselves are part of the um, evidence um, course, yeah. around the document. So they're important to leave traces of them and you can still see them yeah. um, on the document here. But she was also able to um, unfurl this lovely tag that the seal was originally um, attached to. And you can see that this has a slit through it. It's, the ends would have been uh, tucked through this slit to make a, a kind of knot that the seal would have been attached to. Okay. And you can actually see some of the um, original wax. Yeah. Um, it's white on here, is yeah. still, still attached, but sadly the seal is, is no longer. But the, uh, the lovely thing about this new enclosure is that all aspects of the, the document can be seen, including um, the writing on the, the reverse. And you can see very well on this side how the document would have been folded up at one point into just this kind of four by three inch um, rectangle. And it would have been quite a small area that uh, this writing would have been um, written on and that would have told people what the, what the charter was. Yeah. But it's, um, it was, it's a charter that grants lands to the city of Aberdeen by Robert the Bruce, and it was granted um, to the city in 1319. So it had its 700th birthday last year. 
So you reckon this may have been held by Robert de Bruce himself? It would have been in his presence, that's Amazing. for sure. <laughs> Amazing that we can stand here and you can show me both the front and the rear without us actually having to touch this object mm -hmm. at all. That yes. is beautiful. It's very robust now. Yeah. In this lovely and so this makes it perfectly possible for you to bring this along, to give it to a researcher mm -hmm. for it to be mm -hmm. studied. That's right. Now, what about if we go even bigger than that? Even bigger. <laughs> well, um, the next item that I've got is um, this plan, um, which is the original, um, one of the original plans of Union Street, um, drawn in 1798. Um, and you can see that it's straight away that it's in a, a box and much like the um, photographs that we spoke about earlier on, um, the box is the first line of defence um, against water ingress mainly, but it also means that the, the plan itself is very uh, robust um, and it's a lot easier to store on the shelves um, than um, a rolled item uh, just on its own. Yeah. Um, you will quite often find that um, plans that are rolled together and then put one on top of the other. The ones on the bottom tend to get squashed into, into ovals, so um, a nice robust box like this one, um, you know, prevents that from happening. Now we're not going to untie this one, no. <laughs> uh, because it is so beautifully rolled, but what we can see is that it has been conserved, this object, because we can see there would have been cuts in the paper mm -hmm. and they've been filled in by a conservator. And then the whole piece has been rolled between layers of that same polyester material, mm -hmm. the melinex. Mm -hmm. And that was to stop the layers of the actual map rubbing against each other and potentially right. catching. Mm -hmm. And it's given the whole map uh, a lot more rigidity that allows you to handle it mm -hmm. safely. And it's been cut quite a bit bigger than the map itself. So again, we have um, an edge that we can safely handle without touching the map. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a beautiful storage method. And it's, it's round about um, two and a bit meters long, this, wow. um, this plan. So um, when it's rolled out, it's absolutely huge. But uh, because of the, the enclosure that it's now in, it's very, very robust. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's great. So we're trying to keep the artifacts in the archives in as best a condition we can. Here we have a box of items that don't look in such wonderful condition mm -hmm. the way they've come into the archive. Yeah. So what happens when a box like this, full of beautiful old documents, but very soiled and dirty, come into the archive? How do you deal with that? Well, as you can see there, um, they've been kept in quite, um, quite nice bundles um, like this. So um, um, there's quite a number, um, as you can see, in the, in the box. And, but you're quite right that many of them are um, quite, um, quite filthy. And you quite often find in these older items that smoke and dust has accumulated um, on, the, on the surface of these. Now, um, a very quick and easy way to uh, get the worst of the, the dust off is to um, utilize uh, what's called a smoke sponge, um, which comes in quite big blocks like this, but you can cut off um, much smaller um, parts of it like this, which can, you can just hold between your, your finger and thumb. And then just very gently, you can, um, you can clean the surface of these documents um, to get the worst of the, the material um, that's adhering to the surface away. Uh, you do tend to find that the worst of it accumulates in the folds of the, the paper. Um, so that's a really good way of um, just ensuring that the, the dust and um, the smoke particles that have adhered to the, the surface of uh, these uh, letters and um, such like um, can easily be cleaned away. Mm -hmm. 
And you're doing that very gently. It's almost like stroking rather than giving it a good rub with an eraser. That's right, that's right. Um, I mean, in the archive courses that are taught these days, there, are, there are, is an element of um, elementary conservation uh, and preservation um, work that archivists need to um, be taught in order to uh, just give the basics about cleaning and handling yeah. and so on. Obviously, um, conservators go into the subject in much, much more, more detail um, and it becomes quite scientific um, from, from their point of view. There's an awful lot to it and, um, you know, some of the, some of the conservation work that is done um, on items in our archive, it's quite amazing to see the before and the after. Um, it's, they, they're kind of alchemists in a way, the conservators because they, um, they do perform miracles. What, what you thought might have been beyond repair um, can be brought back to life, um, almost literally. Um, and the, you know, the, the colors become more vibrant in um, maps, for example, um, that have undergone conservation work. And the, they enable items to just become, um, be more durable and handleable by not only staff but also members of the public as well. Yeah and you touch on an interesting aspect of conservation work which is all the recording and documenting that goes with it because mm -hmm. um, not only do conservators uh, they, they do a kind of repair, I guess, a bit like what we can see on the television at the moment with the repair shop. Mm -hmm. But of course, it happens very much within a context of ethics and of sustainability and often of reversibility. So that first of all, they will record the, the condition that something arrives in. Then they'll document the process that they apply and then they'll photograph the end result. So you can see the before and the after. Mm -hmm. And the recording process also involves writing down what materials were used in the treatment so that if in the future it should need treatment again, or it turns out that, that it was not as long lasting as we had hoped, that treatment can be undone. And maybe at that time, there are new treatments that have mm -hmm. come in that deal better with the issue that needs to be dealt with. So that whole process of recording and documenting creates a little archive in itself yeah, that right. of course someone somewhere is going to conserve mm -hmm. and preserve at some point. That was lovely, thank you so much for mm -hmm. showing us that.